You received a call from an inmate at the Department of Corrections. This call will be recorded and monitored. If you wish to block any future calls of this nature, dial 7 now. To accept this call, press 5 now. To decline this call, hang up. Well, hello, Jeffrey. How goes the battle? Well, that's good. You know, it's it's nice to hear uh, a little bit of good news here and there. So, uh, oh, really? Oh, well, that's, that is definitely enlightening. Okay, and so you have, what, several people that, that want to share an idea? Okay, so you have some, some uh, complaints. And uh, I've gone through the proper system over there. Okay, and... Uh, now you just want to get this information out to the public. Well, that's good. You know, the mass incarceration does have an impact on families and communities, even the justice system. And the more information we share, the better off we have it. So as a prison reform organization, I'm 100% behind incarcerated people sharing their ideas. Okay, that is fantastic and and yeah I I know that there's a lot of abuse and um, a lot of uh, revenge I guess that goes on in there and, and uh, you know I don't want you guys to uh, be broadcasting this stuff and then have them retaliate and uh, create these new restrictions and stuff on you because that's when they really get to that abusive state fantastic fantastic so uh, as long as you you feel comfortable about it i would broadcast everything oh yeah yeah we, we we publish names i mean the more detail you give i think the more believable it is to folks so when people are listening They'll know that this is, one, from an incarcerated person, and two, that it is something that's really going on in there and something that could very well impact them, if not right away, possibly in the future. And so we, we, we want to uh, make sure that our uh, penal system is doing what the people are paid to do. Yeah, yeah, I, I know, there's... There's so many people that just that just don't care. You guys are secondhand citizens. You, your your uh, lives don't matter, and uh, I, it's it's almost embarrassing to uh, talk to folks from other countries and other states even about some of the way we treat you guys and. They expect somebody to go in happy and healthy, get incarcerated, and come out happier and healthier and a better person. And when you go to bed at night, even with the trauma, you're thinking about these things. And you could be incarcerated, you could be free. Right, I know. And, and the more it goes on, the more complacent people get, the more the public it, expects it and these tv shows and stuff they'll show a few things here and there and people know that it's entertainment and it's designed to keep them interested but the truth is what's really going on there is dangerous people are dying they're getting sick they're committing suicide they're getting high drug overdoses and the list goes on and people can't improve what they don't know about and we don't want to over exaggerate. You have 60 seconds remaining. Well, good. I'm glad you called. And I'm glad you're willing to share this story. And you're not worried about any repercussions against it. And it's really nice that you're finding other folks that want to talk about this as well. So I do appreciate that. And so we can get your message out there on this, uh, this Thursday. And, uh, right. Right. Well, okay. Hey, if they, if they want to send me an email, or if you want to give me their information and I can contact them, let me know. You have thirty seconds remaining. Okay. And uh, yeah, I I've been talking to the folks in the uh, the women's prison, and uh, they're they're on board as well. 
it's just that the more we hit them, the less complaints are getting. So I'll, that's that's the goal. If they put me out of business, I'm not going to shed a tear. <laughs> right? Yeah. We definitely need to uh, put some of those prison officials in the unemployment line. And thank you for using inmate call. Goodbye. Hello and welcome to AQS Inmate Call and I am your host Joel Wilborn and in this episode we'll discuss the impact that mass incarceration has on community, family, friends, and even the justice system. Uh, as we talked about before, being incarcerated is a traumatic experience. Some of the folks that go in there they feel this extreme guilt for the things they did some feel anger that they didn't receive the right sentence or that their uh, case wasn't properly heard or even that they're innocent and you're not going to have a lot of happy people sitting in there but on occasion you know because people are people and they they have different views different opinions people will see incarceration as someplace where they should be and they'll just make the best of it and those are not the ones we're really concerned about we're just concerned about policy that we want to make sure that the Department of Corrections officials properly treats people according to the policy and to the, the law of the state now uh, one of the things I just want to make clear when I discuss these things or to anybody out there, people who commit a crime and are convicted, they need to be in prison. They don't need to be in there for, uh, you know, kind of put them overkill. Well, if a person steals a loaf of bread to feed the family, they don't need to go into prison for 20 years. So, uh, but people who are convicted should go to prison for a, a decent amount of time. As the old saying goes, you know, the, the crime to fit the, the, the time to fit the crime. Let's put it like that. And another thing with, uh, with the prisons is when they do go in there, they should receive the uh, proper medical attention and so uh, locking up a person because I believe people are the ones who commit crimes nothing else you know even a car that's that's sitting on a hill and the brake snaps and it rolls down the hill and kills somebody I'm not gonna blame the car and convict the car there was a mechanical issue it was an accident it was something that you couldn't avoid but it's not the car's fault so when people tell you that guns kill people and that guns are the cause of mass uh, murders, that you have to take that with a grain of salt. You have to look at that. And it's more or less like, really? You think that a gun that is locked up and stored in a gun cabinet is responsible for killing you know, 10, 15 people, and not the person. I, I, I just can't figure that one out. That, that's going to be a mystery of mine for, for years to come. I'll probably even go to my grave trying to figure out why people are blaming guns and not the people. We recently had a court case where the mother of a uh, convicted murderer was convicted of a crime and they did that because they hold her responsible for the child i can i can stand behind that i think families parents community support i think all of this can prevent a crime which to me is more important than locking people up 
And holding them responsible will let them know that they need to pay attention to this stuff. They need to pay attention to the resources that's out there. They need to pay attention to the actions of their child. A lot of children don't just out of the blue start shooting people or committing crimes. There's something that leads up to it. And, of course, that's not 100%. And I'm not an expert on this, so I can't, I can't be quoted on it. But my personal experience is that when I'm talking to people who offer resources and stuff, they're, they're asking us to, to be aware of changes. And when, it's, when I'm dealing with my own family, I know when there's something different in a family member. And I'm sure you guys know too. If you're if you're talking to a family member and the person is is you know a little distant, like they're saying that people who are thinking of suicide, they may tend to give their stuff away. You know, they may play a video game every day, and then suddenly it's like, hey, I, I want to give you my games. I want to give you my video game. You're thinking these are things you hold dear, and you're just giving them away. That could be a sign. It's like I'm not going to need them anymore because I'm going to kill myself. And something you might want to look into or at least consult somebody. You know, if you talk to somebody, you want to call us, call a, a helpline or something. Maybe you can call the, the suicide line and just say, I've, I've got a friend who's acting this way. Uh, what should I do? And uh, we can we can at least work together. And you have to respect privacy. You know, you don't want to walk up to the person and say, hey, are you planning on committing suicide? Or you're, you're acting differently? Or do, or do you want to rob a bank or something? We can't assume anything. And we don't want to just jump out and get in there. But we can talk to uh, professionals and other family members and just voice our concern and, just, and, and get some input. Because if we have six or seven people discussing it, not necessarily with the person but discussing some options and what could be going on or maybe they could look out for it maybe just maybe we could prevent a crime from occurring and maybe that's what happened i know there's a few people that get great accolades because they were vigilant enough to uh report something that was just suspicious and if you really care about a person you're going to do more than just exist in their world You'll ask questions, you'll communicate, you'll talk with them about uh, similar instances or things you've, you've seen on the news and just kind of get an idea of what's going on. And hopefully they'll do the same with you because some of us, when we're, when we're feeling really bad and we want to do some harm, we're not thinking to go talk to somebody about it. But if somebody kind of encourages us or pushes us correctly in the right direction, we might respond in a good way and one thing I, I, I like to emphasize here as well is if a person goes out commits a crime gets convicted goes to prison says oh well I'm gonna be here for a little while and settles in we got to know that this person needs to be properly cared for now the case with Paula Gardner she went into the prison. Now, I'm not going to say she was 100% healthy because I wasn't there when she was uh, placed in the prison and I didn't see her medical records. But she could have gone in there, been examined. They didn't find anything wrong with her and then you know, give her proper medical care that she had before she went in there. You know, maybe she was taking some medicines or something. But they should continue to do follow-ups and regular stuff. Now with females, they do pap smears. And uh, when Paula went into prison, they transferred her to a jail to give her some, some resources, take advantage of some resources over there. And that's where I met her. But they didn't perform the pap smear as they should have. And because they missed that, they missed an early detection of cancer. So she developed cancer and it got to the point where there was really nothing they could do. She's terminal and her, her life is just, it could end at any, any time. And that's devastating for her, devastating for her family, her friends. And so uh, she consulted uh, an attorney and the, the legal team got together, sued the state. And Paula won. 
now I'm kind of thinking, where'd that money come from to pay her? And that's most likely the taxpayers. There's a few instances where they'll do insurance, but still the taxpayers, we who convicted her are now paying because of a mistake that the penal system made. To me, there's better ways to use that money than paying somebody who's going to die because of neglect, something that the system caused. That's not a good way to spend the money. We could, could have at least used that money, let's say, for proper medical care, proper uh, training, more prison officials. We'll be paying all this money. You know how many correctional officers we could hire with that kind of money? The money that we pay out in all these settlements? Is it worth it? Why not do a prevention? Why not do the job right the first time so we don't have to do it over again? Why did we have to give apologies? Why do we have to pay make settlements? Why do we have to go through this? Not locking her up would have put the responsibility on her. Because if she didn't go down and do her proper medical attention and she picked up cancer, she has nobody to blame but herself. But right now, she has the DOC to blame. And she shouldn't have to. We should take responsibility for our actions, not the actions of other folks. Paula pays taxes, too, on the money that she received from the settlement. She'll probably be paying taxes on stuff. And so that money goes back to pay other settlements. Why do we want to keep doing that? Yes, that affects the, the community. So before a jury goes in or a judge sits down, is it going to cost us millions of dollars in settlement? Is it going to cost us millions of dollars for medical treatment, for staffing? Is it really worth it? Are there alternatives? Can we do something else? People who are habitual criminals and they're constantly causing uh, pain and suffering in the community, and constantly committing crimes. These are the folks we really need to pay attention to. If a person is going into prison, you know, for the 10th time, somebody needs to sit down and say, what is going on? I remember an incident with my friend. I was visiting her and she was, we were sitting in prison and I told her, you keep coming back to prison. What in the world is it about this prison that keeps impressing you that you want to keep coming back and she said she likes the order in there she she doesn't have to think for herself the the medical she's told when to go to the medical and when to go to classes and, and when to wake and sleep and eat and it's easy on her. out in the outside world she tends to make the wrong decisions or she'll get bored and start using the drugs and it, and and even though for me that doesn't make sense but for her it did that's what was causing her to be a habitual criminal. So I said, well, let's work on getting you busy, getting a little more order in your life. And she's doing well. I mean, she's not perfect, but she's doing a whole lot better than she did before. And she's not going back to prison as much as she used to. And so I'm proud of her for that. And I'll work with her on that every chance I get. And I know it works because I've seen it. We can find alternative ways to uh, punish a person. We don't have to lock them up. And I really don't like my taxpaying money to go towards settlements. I would rather it go to like a, a halfway house or a work center or even a college education. Let's get, uh, we, we even have situations where Public defenders are overworked and underpaid. That should not be the case in the United States. We need to pay these people well. We need to let them get out there. Because if a person commits a crime, gets a public defender, and that public defender has the time and the resources to do a good job defending this person, that person might get a lighter sentence, no sentence, alternative sentence, or just might be proven innocent and get away. I mean, not really get away, but 
go home and not have to go to prison. That to me is a good source of, uh, or a good way to use my tax paying money. But we're not doing that. And one of the reasons we're not doing that is because people just don't know what's going on in there. When, uh, let's say a, a, a family is, is traveling down the road and they hit a block of ice or something and the car crashes and everybody dies but this little girl, little five-year-old girl. So she, her family's dead and she's in the hospital and a reporter goes to do a story and maybe a family member or friend puts up a, a fundraising effort and the the reporter announces it. And so the community comes together and raises all this money to help out this little girl. They do that because they know about it. If it wasn't broadcast and nobody knew about it, there's a good chance she wouldn't really get the support. And if we do that with prisons, yeah, they're terrible people, but we know there's a there's an issue. We know something's going on. And it could be something that's spreading. If teenagers are uh, shoplifting and doing those um, attacking people in communities and stuff, and we're broadcasting that and we're offering some assistance, we could put an end to it. But if we just kind of ignore it, and to me, there's certain things we need to broadcast, and that's the kind of stuff we do. Not only that there's all these crimes going on, but what do people think is causing it? And I know during the pandemic, people were sitting at home, a lot of the, the students, and they weren't, uh, and they weren't really given the opportunity to co-mingle and hang out with their friends, and it was just kind of frustrating for them. And, and there was a lot of uh, domestic abuse and suicide. And, and people that were just lashing out. And that's stuff we need to pay attention to. We don't need to be going after guns and knives and automobiles. We need to be going after the, what I call a criminal motivator. What is it that's causing these folks to twist that way? Why can't they stay on the, the, the straight and narrow? And when I talk about crimes to other folks, they're saying, I can't understand why somebody would do something like that. It's such a horrific crime. That's because you don't think like that person. That's because you don't have the same background as that person or the same mentality as that person. That person is unique. It's, it's, he is in his own life, his own world, his own uh, situations. And we are in ours. And ours doesn't allow for us to commit crimes like that. And we can talk to them. We can say, well, I just snapped. I wasn't thinking right. But we don't uh, we won't know until we talk to the person. And what I like to do is say, well, what can we do to help others stay away from committing these crimes? And a lot of them give some fantastic advice. They have a lot to offer. And we just need to listen. So I want to try to get as much information out from the prisons as I possibly can. So if you can tune into my YouTube channel, you can just do a uh, go to YouTube and you do a Joel Wilborn search, or you can use the uh, you can look for OxyWord on there, and you'll hear the stories from the people. And that's what I want to get out. And hopefully you'll be able to talk to your friends and family about it too. And Yes, it is possible that your discussions could prevent a crime. Well, thanks for tuning in, and I hope you have a magnificent day, and go out and make fantastic memories for tomorrow.